Let us give our confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Let us greet each other, even those overseas. May we grow spiritually. With this, today's message is entitled, Jesus' Expectations of Me. As we live our spiritual faith, spiritual walk of faith, how can we achieve spiritual growth? And many people may wonder how they may do so. And I have the answer for you. Today's sermon's title is Jesus' Expectations for Me. When we meditate on the just the title for the week, you will receive answers. Jesus' Expectations for Me. We must correctly discern what Jesus expects of us. What does he expect from us? And when you are able to discern that, you can achieve spiritual growth. By aligning our thoughts with Jesus' expectations, and when we apply them in our daily lives, we will naturally progress towards growth. And spiritual growth will continuously, every week, every day, every year, take place. Last week, last Sunday during the VIP day for newcomers, I encouraged those who had settled in the first half of this year so that to fully discard their old selves before their old selves that they had, the culture that they had before they believed in Jesus. You have to fully discard that after believing in Jesus, those habits that and scars and all those prejudice, bias, and stereotypes that you've had before believing in Jesus, you must discard them so that you may put on this new clothes of Christ. And so, if you were to try and put on new clothes on top of old clothes, that would be uncomfortable. It wouldn't look good. But you must completely discard your old selves and embrace your new clothes in Christ Jesus. And that's what I emphasized. We must no longer cling to our former frames, our old frames. And we must completely discard those. And instead live a life befitting a reborn child of God. In other words, we must live a life that achieves spiritual growth. A new life, a new culture, a new language. Completely moving from the language of earth to a language of God's kingdom. There is a Western proverb that says, Growing old is mandatory, but growing up is optional. Obviously, aging takes place mandatorily, but maturing sometimes does not take place. There are people who mature and sometimes people who don't. And just because you attend church for a long time, it does not guarantee spiritual growth. Even though you've received important roles and positions in the church, it does not mean that you will receive mature maturity. Correct choices are crucial for spiritual growth. And it is much more difficult for newcomers to discern on their own because they do not have the discernment. And that is why we tell you through the pulpit. And the word from the pulpit clarifies what it is that Jesus expects from me. And that is why each week you must hold on to the pulpit message. And you have to apply each and every single thing in your life throughout the week. The things that you've written down in your notes, You have once you examine those and apply them, you will achieve spiritual growth. When problems come, people go back to their unbelieving state. And when things don't work out, they just go back to their former ways. They go back to their old habits. How could you call that a believer? How could you call that re reborn and born again? You have to change from your old habits, from your old ways. And you must, the ways that you face the problems and crisis must change. It must be different. We must completely change. 
What does Jesus expect of me from the pulpit? And so there is a newcomer who had come to our church and who, who had grown so much spiritually that he's been following a following the shaman evangel camp team it hasn't even been a year since he's been evangelized and he's matured so quickly that he's going around with the shaman evangel camp team evangelizing shamans have you ever done that before have you ever even gone close around to where they reside obviously you have not you probably can't grow spiritually if you've never even if for this individual, this individual hasn't even believed in Jesus for less than a year. And I've heard his testimony last week. To live a life centered around the pulpit where God's word is proclaimed, that is the essence of our walk of faith. Stop being stubborn, stop giving excuses. Today's passage clearly illustrates what Jesus expects from us. Mark 11 to the end of chapter 16, the essence of Jesus' mission on earth, which is his crucifixion and resurrection, is recorded. And these chapters were so important that it occupied one third of the book of Mark and it accurately and in detail shows us. If you remember this timeline and listen to the word, it will probably help you better understand the message. Last Sunday, we discussed Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, which occurred on the first day of Sabbath. So, uh, in other words, it would be, uh, it was sa the Sabbath was a Saturday, and the first day was Sunday. And today's passage takes place on Monday. So last week's passage took place on a Sunday, and today's passage takes place on Monday. On Tuesdays, various debates occurred, and Wednesday is known as the Day of Silence because no events were recorded. But it was when the conspiracy to arrest Jesus had begun. And Thursday was the day of preparation for the crucifixion. Jesus kept his final Passover on earth, the, the Last Supper, and he delivered farewell speeches and prayed in Gethsemane before being betrayed by Judas Iscariot. And on Friday, Jesus endured repeated trials and suffering before being crucified. So on Thursday, it was from midnight Thursday to Friday dawn that those illegal trials took place. And in the end, around 9 a.m. on Friday, on the, he was crucified and died around 3 p.m. where he said, it is finished. And Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea at the tomb by evening. And Jesus remained in the tomb on Saturday after he had died. And on Sunday, on the third day, on that morning, as prophesied in the scriptures, Jesus resurrected. Why do we keep the Sunday on the Lord's Day? When we say that, we're confessing our faith in the resurrection. We're saying, I believe in the resurrection. And that is why we keep the Lord's Day on Sunday. And as it commemorates Jesus' resurrection. Through Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection, we must be reminded every Sunday as we worship, we must give thanks and be reminded that Jesus has solved all of our lives' problems. And through worship, we are reminded that Jesus has solved everything. And even though there may be various problems, it is Jesus who works all things for good. And that's why we entrust all our heavy burden before God and worship wholeheartedly. That is what the Lord's Day is. 
So today we look into Jesus' journey on Monday. Specifically, the cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple. You might wonder, why curse a fig tree that could have been left alone? And why did Jesus, knowing he would be crucified in a few days, spend time on this? You may think so. However, Jesus conveyed a significant spiritual message through this event. Through this passage, may you realistically hold on to why Jesus, what Jesus expects of us, and may you all become members and believers who achieve spiritual growth. Point number one, Jesus who expected fruit. No, Verse 12 to 14, on the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. After entering Jerusalem, Jesus inspected the temple and then rested in Bethany. The next morning, he, as he was returning to Jerusalem, he was hungry. And so he saw a leafy fig tree by the roadside. So he approached it, hoping to find fruit, but all he found was leaves and no fruit. So Jesus all of a sudden said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. He could have left the tree alone, but why did Jesus have to curse this tree? We may not understand this. And Mark even adds that it was not the season for figs. So if it's not the season to bear figs, then why would Jesus curse the tree for not having any figs? But if we understand how fig trees bear fruits, we might understand the situation better. When it comes to how fig trees bear fruit in Israel, it produces fruit about five times from April to October. And so up until from April, it starts to bear fruit because from November to March, they do not bear fruit. As April approaches, they begin to bear their first fruits, referred to by the Hebrew word. They have different words for the fruits that are bared in each term. The first fruits are called pagim, and in the following fruits are called tenim. While Hebrew uses different terms for the fruits that are bared in, in different seasons, Greek and English and current translations use the single word fig. Jesus used, if you look at the original text, Jesus used the term pagim, and Park referred to tenim when saying it was not the season for figs. And that's how detailed it is when it comes to the original text. So, therefore, verse 13 makes sense logically. Fig trees bear leaves and fruit simultaneously. So the presence of leaves should have indicated a presence of fruit. There should have been fruit. Jesus' expectations of finding fruit on a leafy fig tree was actually reasonable. However, one might still wonder, was it really necessary for Jesus to curse the fig tree? And we might be wondering why he did so. The reason behind this act was to impart a very crucial spiritual lesson to his disciples. The fig tree often symbolized Israel. Our country has its own national flower, but for Israel, it was the fig tree. And what was the state of this fig tree from the passage? It was full of leaves, but it had no fruit. 
In other words, it symbolically represented the spiritual condition of the Israelites who were outwardly flourishing and leafy but bore no spiritual fruit. Because a fig tree should bear fruit simultaneously with its leaves. However, the following passage describe Jesus cleansing the temple, which had become a den of robbers. This state of the temple reflected the Israelite's spiritual condition. Externally, they were vibrant, but internally, they were fruitless and bound to wither. They were living this formal religious life. So Jesus was imparting a message telling us to depart from such life. Jesus cursed the fig tree to visually illustrate that we should live a life that bears fruit, not just a spiritual desolate life. If so, then how can we bear fruit? Jesus explains in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. When we truly experience the life in Christ Jesus, we will bear abundant fruit. In other words, it tells us to have a taste of the blessing of with Emmanuel and oneness. More specifically speaking, it tells us to live a life of the three todays. Today's word, today's prayer, and today's evangelism. May you examine these three, it, whether I've read the word today. Today, for in my case, I don't eat before I read today's word before I even speak or before even I meet someone, before I first do the three todays. Today's word. Today's word. You have to read the word. And so this morning, I had come back. I had returned. And I was meditating. I, was, I sat to meditate today's word once again. But then my breakfast was served so I pushed it aside and I first meditated on the Word of God because this is a promise I made with God it's not religion it's not a religious practice that's what I do you don't have to do that it's not like it's a rule that you have to read the word before you eat but it's just in my case for myself today's word today's prayer and today's evangelism and to proclaim the word I prepare the word first so may I examine these three things I always testify when I was able to practice these three things, my poverty, my difficult problems, unbeknownst to myself, completely disappeared as I started to realistically practice these three things. And through my lips, I was able to give a testimony so naturally and automatically. And prayer just took place. And outside, I'd evangelize. And with joy and gratitude, and with happiness, if you do the work of God inside the Lord, there is just so much happiness. Others may say it's difficult and tiring, but for me, it was, I was just so happy. That is what a walk of faith is. If it's tiring, it means that you're not receiving the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That's a religious life. Oh, I'm just so exhausted and tired. No, that is not the devotion that God desires. But when you do it with joy and happiness, Oh, how is it that I am able to give to you? That's what David confessed. That is what the three today says. You must be able to examine yourself whether this is taking place in your life. Am I meditating on God's word every day? Every day? Am I starting my day with prayer? When you open your eyes, you should start by prayer. Well, as soon as your alarm rings, you should start with prayer. Today, also, on Jesus the Christ, may I enjoy the filling of the Holy Spirit, may I enjoy the kingdom of God today. You have to start each day in prayer. Inside the life that has today's evangelism, it, it, that life will also produce fruit where the Holy Spirit works. Evangelical, evangelical theolo theologian Andrew Murray stated, when we offer ourselves to God in prayer, He gives Himself to us through His Word. It means that God gives us His Word. This means that through the Word and prayer, we draw on the power of the Triune God. 
then in all the fields in our life, we're bound to bear fruit and receive answers in the field of our lives. Therefore, living according to the spiritual stream of the pulpit is crucial. All oh, Yewon believers, may you become 24 hours with the pulpit, and inside all the fields of your life, may you establish Christ's absolute partisan in your lives and become the main figures of transformation. Point number two, Jesus who requested faith. Let's look at verses 20 to 22. As they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. After Jesus cursed the fig tree, Peter noticed that it had withered and mentioned it to Jesus. Jesus responded, have faith in God. What, what was the reason Jesus responded in such way? Peter and all the disciples were marveling at Jesus' power to wither a tree with a word. But at the same time, they were doubting Jesus' ability. How could it be that just because he said something that this leafy fig tree could wither? In the next on the next day and they were doubting him so Jesus knowing this addressed this and gave them a spiritual message Jesus was asking them to have genuine faith in God there is a reason why one might lead a fruitless and powerless life and that is because they lack the absolute faith in God they have no absolute faith in God. What is the first foundation among the ten foundations of faith? It is a firm belief in God's absolute sovereignty. God's absolute sovereignty. And so it is God who saves, who, who strengthens, who weakens, who gives, and who takes away. We must believe in that very God. Without this, one cannot achieve spiritual growth. They will not grow spiritually and have, will have no fruits. In other words, they will have no answers. Pastor Spurgeon once said, man's duty before God is not to have calculated faith, but to have absolute faith. Calculations in faith, calculations are for God to make. It's not something for us. The more we try to calculate before God, the more we end up losing. And so, if Jesus, let's say that if there's a child who tries to calculate be in, before their father, it would only be the child's loss. How is it that we dare to try to calculate before God? Jesus emphasized that the starting point for bearing fruit is faith. It is faith. The start and the starting point to bear fruit is faith. And then it is hi the highlight and then highlighted is the importance of prayer of faith. Verses 23 to 24, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, and it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Even though people claim to believe in God, if they do not bear fruit, it is because their faith is incomplete and it is because they harbor doubt. It is because they doubt. Oh, apparently God is alive, but how can I believe so? It is because they doubt. And also important is because they do not pray. They do not pray. Even though they may drink all night long, they do not pray. Even though they try all these ways and those ways, they do not pray. They do everything else but pray. Why? Because they do not believe. 
A characteristic of people who do not believe in God is that they do not pray. They do not pray. And all they use are humanistic ways, and they only think about humanism, but they do not pray. They don't ask about Jesus' method. To not pray means that they do not believe. If they don't believe, how can they pray? A life full of Jesus' life and power, a life that bears fruit, depends on the prayer of faith. When we ask in faith, we do not receive because we do not ask, it said. When we truly have faith and pray for the salvation of a soul, we will see the evidence of moving mountains. To pray for one soul, you've seen the flesh and bone evangelism team? What does those individuals have anything to do with us? But they go to the far, far countryside. They go all night long and they proclaim the gospel and baptize. Individuals without faith will never be able to do that. But because they know that a soul is more precious than the thousand treasures of the earth, they're able to do so. But people, if they don't know that, whether you go to hell or not, and individuals may say, oh, I don't have to reveal this embarrassing family of mine to believers. But those individuals are individuals who do not believe. It's just they're all pretending. But if you truly believe in the salvation of a soul and really believe in eternal life, you that can't be so. Even though it, I may be ashamed, even though it may be a bit embarrassing for myself, one will come to the conclusion that their parents, their family must be saved. That is the individual that has faith. How important is that? The reason we do not receive is because we do not ask, but when we truly have faith and pray for the salvation of a soul, we will see the evidence of moving mountains. What that means is that it is, we will be able to, we should believe in God who makes the impossible possible. Even though we may not be able to do it, God can. And that is what God says to us. What is the greatest miracle of all? What is the greatest miracle of miracles? The greatest miracle is the miracle of the salvation of a soul returning to the Lord. It is a miracle. Each newcomer, it is a miracle. The soul more precious than the thousand treasures of the earth. Even if we were to sell all of Kangsa region, even if we were to sell all of Seoul, and even if we were to sell all of the earth, that one single soul is more precious. And so how precious is the individual who prays for the salvation of that single soul? As stated in the passage, a life of believing and asking in faith, it will, re will result in evidence of fruitfulness. However, a major obstacle to a fruitful life is unresolved conflicts in human relationships. Verse 25 says, and whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. A heart that hates another will become the pivotal aspect that blocks prayer. If you can just think, oh, I hate that person. I want that person to completely perish. I want that person to just die. Whether it's a family, a cousin, a relative, a believer, or a neighbor. If you even have a single individual like that, you won't be able to pray. You won't be able to have a deep prayer. You might be able to give a formal prayer. And that is why our Yewon believers, you should not have a single person you hate. When you pray, God will urge you to go and resolve that conflict. God won't receive your prayers. God will ask you to first resolve that relationship. What does Jesus say? He said the Lord commands us to forgive first. When Jesus was when Jesus suffered and pierced for us, Jesus called upon God, Lord, may you forgive the sins of these individuals. And it was not only just Jesus, but even Stephen had given that confession. When you start to forgive others, you start to transform. 
and the blocked doors of prayer open and our lives transform into lives that are dynamic. And what does it result? It results in a fruitful life. God answers us. The fig tree in today's passage is not a tree that is beautiful or useful. It can't even be used for firewood or construction. Its sole purpose, one single purpose, is for it to bear fruit. As we believe in Jesus Christ, we have been free from all curses of Genesis 3, from all sin and death, and we have been granted eternal liberation and true freedom. So we who have been granted such, our sole purpose is to bear fruit. We who are so insignificant before God, what can we do before God? All we can do is to live for the kingdom of God, for the saving of souls, to be diligent and faithful in the positions and roles that have been given to us. This week, the UK evangelism camp will take place. It will be centered on our young adults. There, it is so precious. And that is why I've also chosen elders from the young adults so that they may lead them spiritually. Our young adults are over the they are more than 1,000 young adults. They're carrying out this spiritual movement, and each day they're, they are changing a new spiritual atmosphere, and may they become individuals of the Holy Spirit and become the new young adult generation. May you please pray for the UK Vets Camp that will be taking place this week. And I will also be conducting the closing lecture of the Pal uh, Palawan DTS. Please pray for these missions. May you look at the schedule and pray for it. When we believe, ask, and, re and restore the field, we will experience the joy of bearing fruit. I bless all Yewon church members to become people of living faith who initiate these life-giving dynamics. This is the conclusion. From the 26th of this month, the Summer Olympics will be held in Paris, France. Athletes from 206 countries, totaling 10,500 participants, will compete. South Korea will also send 144 athletes. Unlike previous opening ceremonies, it is different. The Paris Olympics will feature a unique entering ceremony. They will be entering by boats along the Seine River. It is an outdoor water ceremony. It will be quite a scene, and I'm excited for it. Centered on the Eiffel Tower, they will be enter featuring a unique outdoor water ceremony. And so it's not even, the swimming events will also take place in the same. And I've gone there and the water quality is, is very poor. And so I'm quite concerned because how can they swim in such poor quality water? And so compared to our Han River, our Han River is at least blue, but it's, I thought the Seine River was very famous, but the water quality was very, very poor. And I think it may be maybe half of the Han River when it comes to its size, but apparently all swimming events will take place in that river. So such events provide a variety of spectacles, but the highlight of the Olympics is winning the gold medal. And so everything else is just not as significant when it comes to winning the gold medal. Achieving the pinnacle of success and winning a gold medal, it brings indescribable joy. All the labor, the tears, and the sweat that one had to shed in the past, 
com is completely compensated through that gold medal. If you look at 1 Corinthians 9.24, the Apostle Paul compares the life of a fa faith to a sports competition. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. At that time, a race was the, the most significant competition. And Paul was the one who had run towards the spiritual goal of medal. He pressed on toward the goal to win the prize for which God had called him heavenward in Christ Jesus. with the spiritual posture of pressing on tour. You shouldn't have a single day where you're just letting it pass by. Since July of 1979 until now, not a single day do I just let it pass without doing anything. That's how God made it so. I've gone around this earth many times. And God has given me the five powers so that I may be able to may be able to carry out that work. Just as Paul said, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God had called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. If you are discouraged and you are swept by what people say here and there, you're not pressing on towards. Satan will continuously try to drag you back. He will try to give you unbelief so that you may not receive grace, so that you may be discouraged, so that you may be swept away by other thoughts. God, may I also, like the Apostle Paul, run towards the spiritual gold medal. Hold on to the word and pray. Don't try to make a prayer and form a prayer. That's difficult. That's true religion. But just hold on to the word that has been given to you. And when you hold on to it and pray, then you'll receive answers. Change your spiritual posture. While we live on this earth, there's not a single person that does not have Genesis 3, 6, and 11, and we may face problems here and there. We may make mistakes. Just repent and stand up again and start anew before God. You've been deceived. Look and examine yourself. Can you really throw a rock and cast a rock upon others? How could you be tried by someone else? You're just the same. Don't do those things. God is seeing everything. God sees what is inside of you. And incidents will continuously happen. People and humans are weak. And that is why we need Christ. And that's why we need the gospel. May you only look upon Christ. Don't look at people. Don't even look at the church. Even inside the church, only look upon Christ. And so may you discover Christ. May you only look upon Christ. Come to your senses. Whenever problems come, Christ. And Christ is the solution to all problems. And may Christ also solve this very problem. And may we be able to see that Christ is the solution to all problems. Jesus is my Christ. With this assurance, do not be swept by the weeds that Satan has spread, but may you only look upon only Christ, only. In that way, may you be able to achieve and fulfill Jesus' expectations of you. May you be awake in such way, and may all our Yewon believers hold on to the gospel in such way. Let us pray. Father God, as we live in the field of Genesis 3 in this world, there are various significant and small problems, and there may be various trivial conflicts and significant conflicts, and Satan may continue to try to scatter weeds, 
But may we not lose hold of the expectations that Jesus has for me, and may we hold on to the covenants today, and may we be able to bear fruits in our lives. Every day, may we be able to ask in faith and believe in God. May we not believe in people and believe in the words of people and believe in the news, but may we believe in only God's word. May we hold on to this covenant and may we all be Yewon believers who are successful and victorious spiritually. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.